Hi, thank you for joining us. I'm here with Nori Hill, who I've known for many years. And let's see, Nori, I met you um, at a garage sale you had. You had the biggest bolts of fabric I had ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and as a recent um, graduate from textile program, I was very, very interested. <laughs> Oh yeah. And it began that that brief conversation that we had began um years of um growth for me. So I I just I told you that I wanted to interview you, but I didn't exactly tell you why and I want to tell you why. Um meeting you at that time in my life uh completely um it was a difficult time and it completely transformed the way I thought about myself and about working and in it for the positive. I got to witness you uh, just showing up for life. Even in the midst of all the stuff that was happening, you always, you know, found a way through and found a solution. And um, in the kindest, most supportive way, you told me about a year after working for you, because you hired me later on, yeah, you told me, look, Lisa, nobody cares about the bullshit. You need to do, you need to just do it. <laughs> Basically stop feeling sorry for myself and complaining in the nicest possible way. And it really, because I loved you and respected you so much, it really, um, it, you, it just gave me a, a whole new way of being. So I wanna thank you for that um, kind words and tough love. I really, appreciate it. I've used it throughout my career. Well, thank you. That's very rewarding. It's very <laughs> rewarding. Oh, thank you for being a badass. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said a little bit about why I want to interview you, but um, you're, I want to tell you why I think you're a badass. Also, you know, be, not just because of what you've done for me, but you're just a, um, incredible technical person in general, the way your mind works, but specifically in fashion, knitting, the knits that you came out with in the years of a variety of knits has always just kind of blown my mind. I'm curious, did you always know that you wanted to be in the fashion knitting industry? Oh yes, always. Oh. Uh my family was in the a manufacturing business, the garment manufacturing. And um, I learned how to sew very young um, in the tough way. My aunt was an Italian tailor and uh, she got me going. Yeah. Uh, of course I haven't sewn in years, but uh, I always wanted to be in design and I thought garment design, but as I got into that part of the business, I realized that, and I had the opportunity to go into a startup circular knitting company. I realized that was a lot more creative than garment design. I mean, nobody can take a pocket off or put in machine buttonholes if you didn't want it. You know, they had to go through too much, you know, to change something. So yeah. I, I felt I was much able to be creative that way. Um, I also, as a startup, there were a, a bunch of mechanics and people who were just as excited as I was about this new industry. And we really worked together on it. They taught me a lot. They wouldn't let me touch the machines because I would break them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting you say that because um, you're you're known for not just your knitting design. So I think for the average person, when you say knit designs, people might think um, like you create a bodysuit or uh, like spandex or pants or something, but you're really designing at, at the ground level in the manufacturing facilities with the knitting machines. But the special thing about you is that you had that mechanical background. So you did some funky stuff with knits. Oh yeah. <laughs> you had them taking apart the machines. They used to uh, 
in the old days, they used to really, uh, change the needle uh, arrangements to make interesting construction. But we were able to have a lot of fun with color. Uh, we also were up front and center with the new machinery developments, the electronic machines. Yeah. Uh, and towards the end of my career, when things got very plain and basic, then I got very involved in yarn because I actually minored in textile chemistry and it was great for me because when the industry changed and people didn't want exotic or unusual patterns anymore, they wanted the technology of the yarn. So it just went across the whole broad, broad spectrum and it was good. I can remember it years ago when you were telling me about um this awesome new yarn i can't remember who was doing it uh first but it was made out of recycled plastic bottles right and i was like what what are you talking about and it, it was such a hot conversation that you were having always just like you know five steps ahead of things um in technical materials and and fabric, like coming up with a, the finishes and the construction, the technology. What's been your most fun professional? I know you've done a lot of stuff. Wow, yeah. Um, well, first of all, in this business, you have got to keep thinking ahead because once you're finished with a project, and you get there on time. The next question from your client is what's next? Yeah. So we always have to have what's next somewhere. Yeah. And, and it really transitions. Uh, I worked with a company the last number of years that really didn't want to do any development work. That's it. They just wanted they just wanted production, but they did have a library. And the irony of it was that. Oh my God, way back in the 80s, the late 80s, when I came out here, I did some freelance work for that particular company. And then oh, wow. they went totally different direction and came back wanting to do wonderful technical fabrics. That's so awesome. what I did, because we had to have fashion, we had to show something. I was able to go through their library and change the stitches with yarn and a little bit of construction because technically, it wasn't development, it was a production item. So, and we just did a lot of fashion display work. And uh, we would go to the textile shows and do some great stuff. Uh, I would say the most exciting thing that I've done is the military applications. Oh, uh, because we were able to, it was interesting to work with the military. I had different, um, impressions than I finally got. And, and uh, we were doing uh, fabrics for robots. Oh, interesting. <laughs> like for a sleeve for a robot. For like and a shell? Yeah, and That's it was, I don't know if that really got too far, but I was able to get it, to see the different robotics and what they were coming up with and what they were showing me certainly was different than what they had in their back room. Yeah. But <laughs> sure. We, we specialize in flame retardant fabrics. Uh -huh. Ironically, wool was the base basic for that. Yeah. And um, so we did uh, develop this whole regimen of wool fabrics. And Very unfortunately, all the wool dyeing and finishing is gone. So we had to reinvent it. Domestically or in general? Uh, domestically because yeah. the military wants to do as much as they can in the United States. I mean, oh, they look have at that switcheroo. All, all their yarns come from the Orient Yeah, <laughs> because nobody here spends the time on it, but it, it's a big, big challenge. Very it really interesting. Is. So did you end up, um, you use wool as a base goods. Did you end up putting a coating on it or something in order to make it? Uh, we, we started working just with the yarn. We developed it in yarn. That's awesome. And, That's uh, amazing. Because the, I mean, there are some wonderful 
applications that they can put on French terry and, you know, just traditional yeah. fabrics. Yeah, exactly. But we, we worked in yarn. Ah, very interesting. We yeah. added, um, we added the chemicals to the yarn when they were being made. So that worked out fine. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Um, I always found that the military had definitely working on military projects had such interesting um, parameters and that specifications. I mean, they're books that you get. Oh. They're like this big yes. for the suppliers. You, you have to follow in the testing, oh. like the level of testing that you have to go through is so crazy. It's very it's, expensive too. And it, it's, yes, it's hard for a company to commit to it because they have to understand it takes a long time. You can have a fabric out for about three years before it gets tested and meets the requirements. Yeah. But so, the good thing is the contracts are big. Yes. And when you get you can, them, they're good. Yeah. Once <laughs> you can be a supplier, then it's all worth it. Yeah. 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 Camelback started out, I think, as a military product, but they definitely still supply military hydration packs. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting, the crossover between um, domestic, you know, products for civilians and military. There's a lot of crossover, which I didn't know until I started doing some more technical. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And um, they lead the way, yeah. really. Yeah. No, it's... Uh... It was fun. It was yeah. good. That's exciting. And I like change anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. One thing I wanted to say when when you were saying about um, one of the things that I got from you also that I think made you really badass is going to so many meetings with you and um, you know going to shows and stuff. You are like you're like the Energizer Bunny in the most methodical way you, you go at a really nice pace though um, but you work a lot as an entrepreneur and an independent freelancer you worked more than anybody I knew and you made time for your family like I, I, really, <laughs> I really got that from you that you that that um you don't have to rush through and you don't have to be completely pushed by your um clients you still have to have good boundaries and make time for your family. And I, I, I feel like you did that. Do you think you did that? Um, I think so. As yeah. I kind of, uh, I mean, I had with my daughter, I had typical teenage angst. Yes. And, uh, but everything is fine now. She turned out very well and which I'm sure she did herself, made up her mind. This is it. Oh, and no. I've got you had a lot to do with it. <laughs> that, that would think that, um, you know, I'm weird, but that's fine. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> In all the best ways. Yes. <laughs> Normal is boring, Nori. You, you can't oh, tell, tell me, me about that's, it. That's ever been your goal. <laughs> that's it. That's it. So where do you get your inspiration when you're designing for somebody? I usually, I look at the trends you know, because that's important to some degree. And I go with big bags and uh, I let the, your, my clients talk because right now the industry is such, and when I say right now, I retired in 2015, but- uh, Congratulations. Your clients are so crazed that the designing, their actual designing is just such a small amount of what they have to do. They have to do everything. That's right. That's FedEx, right. The marketing and the, to this, everything. to that. So I try to help them formulate what they were actually looking for. And it usually hit on some of the trends and I could pull out of my bag. I didn't put everything on the table. I just kind of dug in my bag and I was able to come up with what they were talking about. But it also helped formulate their thoughts. So they weren't coming in, looking at 9,000 samples on the table and said, oh, let me try this, 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 and this. They were kind of formulating it in their mind. Yeah. And I think that was my strength. Yeah. Well, when mm -hmm. you're talking about your bag, you're talking about um, you have been working and saving swatches 
for many years. So you had a ability to draw a bunch of different types of swatches and bring them samples, which yeah, yeah, no other designer really kept a library like you. Your library Mm -hmm. was, oh, heaven, (laughs) heaven. And it definitely helped your clients visualize Oh yes, um, what they were doing. Because they have to see it. They. That's right. They did not. They, they kind of have an idea, but yeah. Right. They they, they really the, didn't understand the knitting concepts, and they shouldn't have had to because they had too much on their plate. That's right. So I the tried technical. to explain to them the you know the limitations, which were many, and what they could do, and uh, it seemed to have, for the most part, worked. Yeah. And, and when you talk about um, helping to find limitations for a company that you're working with, you're talking about, and feel free to add on or subtract, you're really talking about um, the limitations of where they want to do production, the limitations of the machines for the factory that they're working in, the limitations for the type of materials that they want to use, nylon right. or acetate, and the limitations for the way, the colors, because each color can dye a little differently. Mm-hmm. Right? Is there other... Okay. No, I mean, that's basically it. But if if they came to the um, the mill, my clients, you know, had, uh, they could see that, you know, they could see that in their presentations. And, um, but I just, I tried to educate them a little bit. You know, Especially the biggest problem I have had, I had with customers was the approval of lab dips. Um, <laughs> the light. It's like, it's like oh, when, you go, when you go to designer school, mm-hmm. I think they tell the kids that you have to reject the color three times. Oh, that's because interesting. The first time, <laughs> make, them, make them work harder, you know? <laughs> And they don't usually go to the right light. They're saying, I'm not going to go downstairs yeah. to the light box. I'm just going to yeah. look out the window. Yep. So you have to educate them to that. Yeah. And then, um, I mean, a lot of us just kind of resubmitted the same color after number four. Right. And they approved it. And they approve it. <laughs> because Well, it's a lot different. So just yeah. to be clear, when you're talking about approving lab dips, sometimes you're talking about a six week process just to get the dips in somebody's hands. Oh yeah. And so because you knit the fabric, dye it, send it out, send it out, dye it, bring it home. So it's not just like, oh, you get to pull up a color and color it on a swatch and send it out. It's a really long process. So to do it over and over. um, And in when they're doing the dyes in the mills, they have technical light they right, have, we have um, spectrometers and spectrometers and the light and uh, it's all computerized right now. It's really great recipes. Yeah, yeah very high tech. Mm-hmm. Like they can read the colors. So so to get lab dips that aren't you know that aren't approved so many times is almost ridiculous. It is because they are Absolutely. color experts. Although I will say there's a couple mills in um, South America I worked with that just kind of guessed and sent it out. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> there are those i i guess you know <laughs> absolutely so they're like this is to... orange <laughs> right and yes it'll match your top that's right, the it'll be fine you, you use it it's good <laughs> that's it that is it so you've worked um you have such a vast just since i've known you and you were already in the industry you know an expert in your field for many years but You've worked, you work not only with a design house, like whatever the brand is, they're designers to get Mm -hmm. textile fabrics. You develop fabrics for the mills. Now, just those two things alone, like if you're developing with the the label, um, that's a totally different skill set than developing at the mill and the timeline. Oh, yeah. to develop bringing to market so you're so when you're talking about the trends and being aware you're holding so many seasons in your head yeah how on earth do you do that it's not easy I, I know people <laughs> would say to me 
what's the color for this year? And I'm already two years ahead. Right. You know, in my thinking and planning and I'm, I don't know, coral. (laughs) Right. It's so different and it's so boring by the time it comes. Oh yeah. I'm already done. But um, (laughs) no, it was a wonderful career. I am so fortunate to have been at the right place at the right time. And to have people that I worked with that were very technical and taught me enough to not appear stupid, you know, and I could ask questions that made sense. That's yeah, about, that's very important too, because you've got to get the respect of your colleagues because you're driving them crazy with all those cones of yarn and everything else. Right. They are not happy when you show up. <laughs> <laughs> but they love the end product, man. They do. Those engineers loved working with you. And yeah, you, you, yeah, you worked them. And they were so proud to be able to do something that nobody else is doing, for sure. It was a treat, um, them getting to work with you. And everywhere that I went in the industry, everybody had something good to say about you. And that's (laughs) right. Absolutely. I was like, oh, yeah, I worked with Nori. (laughs) (laughs) That I didn't drive everybody crazy the way I thought I did. Oh, no. Well, you did, did it in a good way. You, you know, yeah. it's, it's, there's not everybody that has such a um, understanding of it, that the details are so in depth that, you know, they're overlooking stuff and you're calling them out on it. That's going to make it better. So you're increasing their knowledge and awareness at the same time as children. I, I always taught <laughs> anybody that wanted to know what I did. I taught them. Yeah. If they didn't fine, but yeah. you know, I really, wanted to encourage the industry. It was yeah. important. So speaking of that, what do you think like skills, tools, team, what do you think make you so successful? I think it's my 24 seven approach what does that and mean? always being in four places at one time, okay. four seasons, four industries. I mean, I just thrived on it. Um, I was very lucky. I had my husband uh, to, you know, support me. Yeah. And he he was convinced I was crazy. So he went along with it. He helped me with my displays. Yes. And, and, um, you know, a lot of my computer work. So it's very important to have a partner that gets it. Yeah. But, um, It was just one thing after another. I was just so busy all the time. And I've always had lists and I never got the lists done. Never got the house decorated, never did anything. (laughs) Wait a second, your house at Christmas and Halloween. Come on, you had a 16 foot Christmas tree covered with, well, it had a different theme many years, but I love the birdhouse theme. Yeah. That is, that's pretty. And Halloween never goes uh, undecorated. Well, this uh, this year we moved into spectacularly. A condo. We moved into a condo, and the ceilings are only eight feet high compared oh. to our twenty-five foot ceiling <laughs> in, at our home. And I couldn't just go out and buy a ten-foot tree, so we did a. Uh, uh, oh my goodness! I'm trying to think of the name of the thing. We we bent it at the top. It was like tune tune down or something oh, like that. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the Grinch. The was Grinch. The, the Grinch. Yeah, the Grinch. So, <laughs> so the tree was kind of <laughs> right. And we brought we we brought it home, and I Drew said, "Well, now what?" And I said, "Oh, we'll just leave it outside and jam it against the wall so it'll bend." It didn't <laughs> bend. So good old Drew, he had lots of wire and stuff. And Wired he, it. Oh, yeah, that awesome. was really funny. And then <laughs> I got an upside down tree, which I've been fascinated with for years. Interesting. So that's been my last one. <laughs> ah, yeah. See, it was never a dull moment for sure. No. Nope. So I know, I, I know you're a badass in so many ways. I mean, I you know, from the way that you work, your integrity, um, how you hold space for your family and your friends, your straightforwardness. Um, how do you think you're a badass, Nori? I just knew I had to have people 
work with me because what I did was not something I did personal, you know, myself. I needed a team. Yeah. I needed to encourage the people. Um, I think in that way, I was a badass. I was thinking about that because I know when you called me, I said, do you think I was a badass? <laughs> <laughs> yes. But because uh, that's important, because if you don't get that done, you, you sort of are always begging, you know, uh, uh, is my fabric and finishing yet? Is it here? Is it there? And, you know, everything was yeah. in the middle. So um, I think in that way, I was very much so. But most of what I did, the research and everything else, you know, it was just natural. It just came naturally because I loved what I did yes. and I didn't think I was working you know Isn't when you really love something you just keep going well I would say there's another great example of being a badass boss lady because you actually followed a career for something that you love not what you thought you should do right and, and for some people that's really hard mm -hmm. so congratulations on that it made it great for all of us thank you <laughs>